Hello, everyone. In this video, I'm going to introduce to you an alternative method for finding the volume of solids of revolution. Let's jump right in. So you'll remember from the previous three lectures, we introduced a method for finding the volume of solids in three-dimensional space by slicing them. And what we said is that we can find the, the volume of the shape by using these cross-sectional areas. So for each place where we slice X, we find the cross-sectional area and we use this Riemann sum technique to show that the volume can be in the limit taken to be this definite integral over the where you start x equal to a and where you end x equal to b and all of these cross-sectional areas. Now, this is an extremely powerful method and it works very well as we've seen in the previous examples. But there are places where it can be a little bit difficult to apply this. In particular, in the previous lecture, we talked about what happens when we revolve around an axis that our shape is not attached to. This leaves us with an inner and an outer radius and we have to uh, subtract the uh, inner radius from the outer radius in order to get the area of each one of these cross sections. Now, let me show you where this could possibly go wrong, where things get slightly more complicated. And I'm gonna do this entirely with an example in this video. So let's say I ask the following of you. I say uh, the region enclosed by the x-axis and the parabola y is equal to 3x minus x squared is revolved around the vertical line x equal to minus 1 to generate a solid. So the same general idea as what we've been doing in the previous videos. And we're asked to find the volume of the solid. Now, we've seen how to start this. The first thing that we should always do when we approach these problems is to offer up a little sketch so we know what we're dealing with. So let's start with that. Okay, so my curve is a parabola. We can see that it has roots at x equal to zero and x equal to three. So then we get our parabola just like this. The line that we are going to be uh, revolving around is x equal to minus one. So that is back here. So here is x equal to minus one. And we're gonna revolve around this thing like this. And the area that we will be revolving is all of this in here. Okay, so if we were to do this using uh, the method of cross sections that we were introduced to in the previous videos, uh, we would first need to calculate an inner and an outer radius. So remember that this curve is given by 3x minus x squared. We are rotating around a vertical axis. So if you go back to the previous examples, that means that to find the inner and outer radii, we are going to need to find an inverse relationship because this is radius of y and our larger radius is again as a function of y. We're asking ourselves how high up on the height we are, which means if you remember from what we did, we need to find an inverse for 3x minus x squared. 
Now, this is not a directly invertible function. You're going to have to break it up in order to find uh, capital R of Y and little r of Y. And this might be uh, slightly cumbersome, right? It might be a lot of work. Um, and so what I wanna show you is a different way that we can do this. And this is through what's called the method of cylindrical shells. So if you think about this, and a different way, instead of taking these, uh, these horizontal cross sections, we are going to take vertical cross sections on this. And here's the general idea. If I just isolate my region, so if I isolate my curve, and I say, this is the region that I care about between zero and three, what I could do is I could first use the Riemann sum approximation of this. So let's imagine I take a rectangle here. And I do this all the way across the space. I don't want to clutter my picture. So I'm only going to draw in one rectangle just for illustration. This rectangle has width delta x. It has height equal to um, f of, say, xk, where this point right here is assumed to be xk. We're doing the same thing we always do with Riemann sums. We partition up the space evenly using delta x. And then we draw these rectangles. The height is given by a point on the function. OK, then what do we do? Well, we can approximate the volume of this, uh, what ends up looking like a, a sort of flan cake sort of object. If you imagine this thing rotated around, um, you can approximate this thing using these rectangles getting pulled around. So instead of taking these horizontal cross sections and finding the area of those things, you have these little cylinders. So you can imagine pulling each one of these rectangles around to generate out a full cylinder. And so you can imagine this, if you're looking at this sort of cake object from the top down, you're almost taking a cookie cutter and just pressing it in. And the result is this very, very thin little cylinder. And then you make a slightly wider cookie cutter, press it on, and you get another one. And so the result is, if you just isolate one of these little cylinders, you're going to get something that looks like this. So you'll get a nice cylinder with the middle of it poked out. And in this case, the width of this thing, or the depth, however you'd like to think of it, the width, sorry, is equal to delta x. So it's very, very thin. The height is equal to f of xk. So this is all just coming from uh, the original rectangle. Then the question is, um, how do we calculate the volume of this thing? Well, what you can imagine doing is taking a pair of scissors and cutting right down the edge or down one side of this thing and sort of unrolling this cylinder to give you a big uh, rectangle that has a very, very small depth or width, however you want to think of it, extending into the third dimension given by delta x. So what you would really get here is something that looks like this. So all I did is I just unrolled my big cylinder. And again, this height is given by f of xk. My depth is given by 
delta x. And so the question is, if I want to find the volume of this thing, I just need to know what that length is. So the question is, what is the length? Well, the length is given by the circumference of this, of this cylinder. So this length is given by two pi times C. And so you can imagine now, you do this over all of the partitions and you generate all of these, these cylindrical approximations. They sort of, they stack around each other until they give you a nice sort of discrete approximation of the object that you want to find the volume of. And then we let the number, uh, we let delta x go to zero, which is the same as uh, letting the number of points in space go to infinity. And this essentially gives you a uh, definite integral that you need to calculate out. So let's actually do the work here and let's see what happens. So let's say the volume of each cylinder is going to be, so the volume of cylinder K, as I just said, is going to be uh, the circumference times the height times the thickness or the depth, if you will. So the question is, what is the circumference? What is the height? And what is the thickness of this thing? Well, the height and the thickness we've already calculated. Let's ask ourselves, what is the circumference now? Let's look back here. The radius of this thing is going to be the distance. So if I draw my XK back on here, for example, the radius of this thing is the distance from where you're revolving around all the way up to XK. So the distance is given by XK minus minus one, the distance from XK to minus one. And then we remember that the, the formula for circumference is given by two pi times the radius here. So that gives us two pi one plus xk multiplied by the height, which is y at xk. So three xk minus xk squared, and then times our thickness, which is delta x. And so that tells us that the total volume by this Riemann sum approach is approximately the sum over all of these cylindrical shells that we're using to build this thing out, which is equal to exactly what we have written above, which is two pi one plus xk and then three times xk minus xk squared times delta x. And so we know where this is going, right? We can let n go to infinity, and we can say that the total volume is equal to the limit as n goes to infinity. So the, the limit of these Riemann sums, oh, pardon me, which gives us a definite integral where we get two pi one plus x, three x minus x squared dx. And the question is, what are the bounds on this thing? Well, let's go back for a second. We were taking this Riemann sum approach here. We are looking for essentially the area underneath the curve. Uh, and the curve is running from x equal to zero all the way up to x equal to three. So this gives us the bounds on our definite integral. And now we're in familiar territory, right? We're, we've moved into a space where this is now just a problem of algebraic manipulation. And so let's go ahead and let's get the answer here. So let's expand out that polynomial. 
So we get two pi and then three X squared uh, plus three X minus X cubed minus X squared DX. These are polynomials. Finding their antiderivatives uh, isn't too hard of a thing to do. Furthermore, those X squareds uh, can, be, can come together. So we get actually two X squared in there. So this is going to give me zero to three, two pi, and then two X squared plus three X minus X cubed. So a cubic polynomial. If you find the antiderivatives here, we got two pi and then two over three X cubed. That's antiderivative of the first term plus three over two X squared minus X to the four over four, all running from zero to three. Now it's a calculator problem. We take the, the upper endpoint three, we evaluate the function at it, and then we subtract off the lower endpoint zero, in which case the function completely disappears, leaving us with the volume of the full solid of revolution. 45 pi over two. Okay, in the next video, we're going to go a little bit more into the theory of this and provide a few more examples.